another method to obtain fluid flow and reservoir pressure data is called wireline formation testing, WFT. It is far less expensive than the DST, but the data obtained is of lower quality because the samples retrieved are much smaller. In wireline formation testing, the test tool is run on an electrical conducting wire. The WFT is usually performed after the TD has been reached but before the casing has been run. In this method, a spring forces the tool into contact with the side of the hole so that the formation pressure and flow samples can be taken. The main advantage of wireline formation testing is that multiple zones can be tested at once on a single run. At this point, after the TD has been reached, the open hole logging suite, consisting of multiple open hole logs, is performed. Like the mud log, it is a foot by foot or meter by meter chart that shows what is actually in the thousands of feet of borehole. It makes up the most amount of formation evaluation data that is gathered on most wells and is obtained by measuring the electrical, acoustical, and radioactive characteristics of the formations and their formation fluids. It is important to mention here that the main source for most of the formation evaluation data comes from open hole logs that are run on all wells, even those that have been cored or drill stem tested. Like the mud log, open hole logs provide a continuous data flow from the bottom to the top of the open hole, but with much more accuracy. Because steel encasing interferes with most of the measurements, open hole logs are performed before the hole is cased. Using some of the most advanced oil field technology developed by international service companies like Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, and Weatherford, these logs allow the site geologist and petroleum engineer to virtually see inside the well, capturing electrical, acoustic, or radioactive signals that are emitted naturally or induced by emissions, logging tools measure the characteristics of the formation and their formation fluids. Professional log analysts and petrophysicists interpret these logs. Let me explain a few of the many logging tools available and how they help us determine what is in the borehole. Most oil wells are logged by service companies who are contracted for this specific job. Utilizing their own professionals and crews to run the logs, the service company employees perform the logs on site. Before they begin, the drill pipe is tripped out or removed and logging tools called SONs are run into the hole on an electrical conducting wireline, spooled off a drum mounted on the back of a logging truck onshore or mounted on a skid offshore. Even though new strategies, logging techniques, and tools are rapidly improving and becoming available, their costs can be prohibitively expensive, so here I will describe the traditional, most common logging operations still used in most locations. In any event, whether the latest technology is used to log a well or older technologies are used, logging is and will remain to be a major part of the well's overall financial cost in the foreseeable future. First, in a typical scenario, several sons are combined into a single assembly and run together. By the way, the French word son, meaning an electrical sensor, was first adopted for these tools because the technology was invented in France by a company called Schlumberger. Consequently, the word sonde is still commonly used. In this method, a sonde is run to the bottom of the hole and is slowly raised to the top, recording the outputs and emissions on a chart as they occur. This is called the actual logging sequence. The logged interval usually extends from the bottom to the casing shoe. This interval is referred to as the open hole portion of the well. 
The first two logs we will describe here are used to determine lithology. The first is called the spontaneous potential, SP log. Spontaneous potential refers to the naturally occurring electrochemical potential of cations. For example, when the drill bit penetrates the boundaries between porous, permeable zones and the non-permeable surrounding shales, the equilibrium of these cations is disturbed, causing them to move. These moving cations, which have been activated by their release at the boundaries, can then be measured using this log. The data obtained is used to identify potential sedimentary reservoirs and to establish their thickness and depths from the surface. The second log, the gamma ray or GR log, measures the intensity of naturally occurring gamma ray emissions in the surveyed formations. Containing a scintillation counter that records the intensity of naturally occurring gamma rays, these tools act like a Geiger counter. Because shale rock typically emits a high level of radiation, while sandstone or limestone, reservoir rock, typically emits a lower level of radiation, these deflections can indicate the bed boundaries between shale and a reservoir rock, the reservoir rock's exact depth, and its thickness. Thus, like the SP, the gamma ray log can give an indication of lithology identification. Because the saltier mud water in the formation can obscure the results of the SP log, the SP and gamma ray logs are done in tandem to assure accurate lithology identification. Next, the following three types of logs are used to measure the porosity of the well. They are the 1, density log, 2, the neutron log, and 3, the sonic log. Let me explain how each of these is used in more detail. The density log is made by a radioactive source that is placed into the sun and records the emissions of gamma radiation. Emitted from a radioactive source, these high intensity gamma rays differ from the naturally occurring ones recorded on the gamma ray log. These emitted gamma rays are directed into the formation and a detector records how many are reflected back to the sun. The more gamma rays that are reflected back, the lower the formation's density. A lower rock density reading indicates higher porosity. Second, the neutron log records the emissions from a neutron generating radioactive source that is placed into the neutron sonde. A detector measures the amount of neutrons captured. Neutrons are highly influenced by the amount of hydrogen that is present in the formation. Hydrogen found in water, oil, and gas will greatly affect the amount of neutrons that are captured. Porosity from the formation is also related to the rate of capture of neutrons because fluids with hydrogen are present in porous rock. Thus, the more hydrogen atoms present indicates the greater porosity of the rock. Gas, however, contains much less hydrogen than water or oil. The presence of gas will give a very low or false reading of the porosity. This porosity, therefore, is compared with the density porosity and gives us a better indication of the presence of gas. High gas saturation rather than oil saturation. Let me show you an illustration. Here you can see the density curve and the neutron curve will generally track each other in measuring the porosity, but in a gas zone, the neutron curve greatly distorts the data. An indication of error when comparing the two logs gives a good indication that this is a gas zone. Third, the sonic log is a logging tool that generates a sound pulse that is measured by its travel time through the formation by receivers mounted some distance from the sound generator. This travel time, or transit velocity, is related to porosity. Also, by subtracting the sonic porosity results from the neutron porosity results, we can more accurately separate the intergranular and volgular porosities. In addition, 
Knowing the lithology of the rock from the SPN gamma ray logs, the porosity can be more accurately calculated to give us total porosity. After identifying the boundaries, lithology, and porosity with the previous tools, the engineer next needs to know something about fluid type. The resistivity log helps get him that information. Salty water made up of sodium and chlorine with the abundance of free ions within the pore space conducts electricity better than those filled with oil or natural gas. This difference in conductivity in the case of salty water or resistivity in the case of crude oil or gas can be measured on the resistivity log. As can be seen here, crude oil or gas is much more resistive to the flow of electrical current than salty water. In addition, the resistivity log will give a good indication of the type of saturation that is in the reservoir rock. It also helps to establish a good approximation of the oil water contact line. Almost all saturation computation methods rely on work originally done by Gus Archie in 1940 41. He found from laboratory studies that in a shale free water filled rock, the formation factor F was a constant defined by RO equals F times RW, where RO is the resistivity of the total formation and RW is the resistivity of the water in that formation. He also found that F varied with porosity in the following relationship. F equals A over phi to the M power. Combining these two equations gives RO equals A over phi to the M power times RW, where RW is measured by taking water samples from the well. Archie then found a relationship between water saturation, SW, and RT over RO, where SW to the negative power of 2 equals RT over RO. Substituting equation 2 into 3, we get the famous Archie equation. SW equals 1 over porosity times the square root of RW over RT. Where porosity is measured from a density or sonic log, RT is measured from the resistivity log, and RW is measured from water samples taken from the formation. Equation 4 gives a simple approximation to estimate the hydrocarbon saturation. SO equals 1 minus SW. More complex versions of the Archie equation have been developed to include more complex lithologies. They are beyond the scope of this lecture. 